Welcome again to Waterstone Fellowship. I appreciate those of you that are here in attendance. It's always exciting to see smiling faces, and some of you aren't smiling yet, but maybe by, by the time we're through, you'll smile. But uh, it's good to see you guys, and a special greeting to those of you that are online. We wish you could be here, but hey, if you're, you know, we're glad you're worshiping with us, and uh, we're looking forward to this second week of a three-week series entitled All In. All in. I got a a scripture verse I want to share with you, and uh, this is coming from our Savior when there was a question of when and what was the greatest commandment, okay? Uh, You know, you got all these commandments, and, and, and so finally a bunch of them got together and said, what's the greatest? You know, everybody wants to know, you know, what's the best? What's the greatest? And, and here's how Jesus replied, replied to that question. He said, in verse 37 of uh, Matthew 22, if you'd like to know where, where I found this, but love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. Then he goes on to say this, and the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then it says, and the law and the prophets hang on these two. Okay. If we all did that, we're just going home right now. <laughs> There's no reason to do anything else because that sums it up. What should we be doing? First, love him with all. This is this all in thing. Where do you think we got that idea? All your heart all your mind and your soul. And I love the way he added, he, you know, the question was, what was the first? But he went on to go, and let me go ahead and tell you while you're asking, I'll give you the second one. Love your neighbor as yourself. That means, now the one thing about these first and second priority commandments, and then he goes on to say, everything else falls into place. Because if you do the first thing right, the second one you're going to do right, and then everything else is going to fall into place. That's in a perfect world. That's something we want to strive for, however, because that's what God asks us to do. So it's okay to fall on our faces and get back up. But let me just share with you that this isn't a perfect world right now. The Bible does say for we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that doesn't give us an excuse not to strive for what He asks us to do. But let me just share this with you. Based on that, how our society and even our churches are not really following that formula. Today's world, you hear the word entitlement a lot, don't you? In today's world, a lot of it's all about me, more of me, less of him. In reality, it should be less of me, more of him. I have this story that I was traveling with my family and it was on a Sunday, and as we travel as a family, we, we want to be a part of a church family, even if it's not the one that we're from, because we're all a body, right? So on that particular day in a whole different town, we decided we're just going to find a church and go and worship. So we, pulls it, we pulled into this parking lot. Rain was just horrible that day. Could have given us another excuse not to go, but we went. We were going to church, and it was raining, and we couldn't find a good parking place. And we had to park way, way out. And we got out of the car and we didn't have umbrellas. And we walked and we walked and we walked. By the time we got into the church, we were drenched. Just drenched. And we're looking around. It's a big church. You know, we're looking around and, you know, kind of have that deer in the headlight look. You know, we're like, help. There's even a welcome center over here and, you know, no help. We finally maneuvered our way to figure out where everything is and we ended up going to church that morning and we it was still raining when we left we got back in our car and it's lunchtime we like to eat don't we so we drove to a restaurant as soon as i pulled up in the restaurant a person from the restaurant opened our door with an umbrella and a towel. And they did that with everybody in my family and walked me to 
the restaurant. Then they seated me and served me. Now, let me just explain something to you. If I had to join something that day, I'd have joined the restaurant and not the church. Now, before we get too upset with churches and our own attitudes, I want you to think about this. Now, don't point. Don't look around. This is between you and God. I want you to think about when's the last time, and for some of you, it could have been last night. For some of you, it could have been this morning. When's the last time you went somewhere and the service maybe wasn't as good as it should have been? Maybe the, long, the line was too long. Whatever, there's some reason why you were, you were upset. And what did you say? You either thought it or you said it out loud. I am never going back to that place. I think everybody in this room is guilty of that at some point in their lives, if not many, many times. So we, before we get too upset with uh, society and the secular world, let's bring it to the church. How many times have you come to a church, your own church even? You didn't get to find the right parking place. You came through the front door and no one greeted you. You sat down by yourself and no one talked to you. It wasn't the music selection I would have picked. I surely don't like that, that message, the guy that's doing the message. I, I, I would think of a much better sermon or a much better person preaching the sermon. If some of y'all feel that way today, don't tell me, okay? <laughs> but we ourselves are in an entitlement, whether we think so or not. I want you to know something about this morning. The worship is not about you. I'm not trying to be ugly and mean here. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. The worship's not about us. It's about Him. And could you imagine if we honestly felt that way coming into this service, coming into God's house, that we already are in a spirit of worship before we walked in? It wouldn't matter if there was videos, live music, contemporary music, this kind of music, that kind of music. We would be worshiping in unity for Jesus. Priority commandment. Could you imagine if we felt that way, we wouldn't have to worry about who greets us because we'd be out there greeting others. Wow. I love what Bob said last week in, in the message when he talked about attendance. He talked about we're, 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 there, we're here to bless other people. I'm thinking about, you know, we, we always think T-shirts. I'm thinking about getting a shirt for that. How can I bless you this morning? You know, I mean, something that, that's talking about others instead of ourselves. There's a scripture reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I've used this so many times over the years in so many different occasions. In verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, it's a series of traits that make the purest definition of love. And there's something, if you read it, and I encourage you to read it later on, read it several times. Uh, I, I go back and reread it times to remind me that this is not about us. If you read those verses, every single trait is about someone else. It's about serving someone else. And the person that doesn't get it, well, what, when do I get my needs met? <laughs> They miss it. They really miss it. I know we have some in here that professional counselors. I know in, in, in my 30 years of ministry, 35 years, I've done a lot of counseling as well. And I use that in, in relation. It, it deals with relationships. It deals with your job and, and your coworkers. It deals with marriages. It deals in every situation. If we took 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 to heart, unbelievable what would be happening in our world. Just like if we took these first two commandments to heart. I want to share with you today, uh, and you might wonder, well, what does that passage have anything to do with what we're talking about? 
But at the end, hopefully you'll, you'll get an idea. But I've chosen, as far as a, a main text, I've chosen the book of John, cha- uh, chapter 21. And it's going to be verses 15 through 17. John 21, 15 through 17. And, and again, you'll understand this when we get through it. But today, it's all in service. Last week, it was all in attendance. Next week, it's all in giving. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, Ron, because now no one will show up. Uh, (laughs) But if we understand loving God with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls, loving others first, giving won't be a requirement. It'll be a privilege. It'll be a celebration. Serving won't be, oh, I have to. It'll be a celebration. It'll be a joy. It'll be a reward. It'll be, it'll be peace. It'll be something that is so fulfilling in your life. And you have to understand the most fulfilled person, the happiest person in the world is somebody that's investing in others. Somebody that's giving to other people. That's the greatest legacy you can, you can share. So let me go ahead, and, and, and we're talking about service today. You notice I have all this, I'm not trying to shame you into signing up. I was pointing over there, there's nothing over there. Uh, uh, there's, there's sign-up sheets all around the room. There's, there's, these are just some of the many things that we do here at Waterstone Fellowship. But my motivation for you to sign up is not because we... We need you or we this and this. It's not a requirement. It's a privilege. I want people to serve because they love. Because the number one commandment. That's what I want to do. So let's, let's, get, let's d- dive into this service right now. Uh, another thing that was brought up before we talk about the reasons we should serve. Uh, think about even the, the disciples. You'll find in the, in the, in the uh, New Testament... The disciples were, I'll just give you a summary. They're, they're, they're just getting back from an event. They all had a responsibility God gave them, you know, that the Lord gave them. And guess what they're talking about? Who's the greatest? <laughs> Again, we're, our nature is to be self-self. It's all about us. They're talking about who's the greatest. Can you imagine? I could just, I'm just trying to visualize, you know, G, you know, James and Peter and all these guys are walking around and, you know, and they start story topping each other. Yeah, Jesus sent me over here and I had 12 saved and two baptized. What about you? Well, I had 13 saved and five baptized, you know, and then it just got crazy after that. They just started pushing each other's stories and they're over there talking about who's the greatest. And then they came in and there was Jesus. I love it when Jesus gives us a, a lesson. He used what? A little child. A little child as, a, as an illustration. Come to me as a child. In fact, he went on to say, if you want to be the greatest, well, I can imagine they're like, I don't want them to listen. I want to know. You know, I want to be the best disciple. I want to be, then be the least. I'm sure they didn't really want, really want to hear that. But basically what the concept was, you want to be the greatest? Then give your all. Give your all, and if you're going to be the greatest, then you need to serve. It doesn't make sense to this world to do that. But, but, but I'm going to tell you, it doesn't have to. What does it say? We're not of this world anyway. We're just time sharing, I guess, until something else comes up that's much greater. But I want to go ahead and read this, this, this verse. This is Jesus meeting with Peter After all this stuff took place, remember Peter's like, I'm not going to deny you, Jesus. I'm Peter, searching to be the greatest. Jesus said, yeah, you are. Not only once, not only twice, but three times. I don't know about you, but I would hate to hear that from my Savior. But I also am humble enough to know that he could say that to me. He said it to Peter, and I know Peter meant well. I know in his heart, he was all prepared to deny. I mean, not to deny. Ron and I had a conversation before the service. We, we tend to talk about the end times a lot. 
and we were sharing together about during those tough, tough times, how would we act? And I have to admit, I was acting like Peter when I, when I answered Ron. I was like, well, I'm going to be a martyr. I'm going to just go down swinging for my faith. But how do we know we're going to be that way? How did Peter know that when it really came down to that, was he going to deny Jesus three times? So Peter's now carrying this around in his life. This is tough. It would be for me. I know it would be for all of us. And Jesus knows this. And I love, I love how Jesus restores people. Aren't you glad he restores us when we mess up? Aren't you glad that we have a second chance with Jesus? Aren't you glad there's this thing called grace? And even through discipline, there's grace. They're both important. They both happen. So Peter's kind of moping. He's denied Jesus three times. It's now, you know, Jesus died. And, and now what did Peter, you know, what was interesting that, that these guys are back to what they've been doing before Jesus came. How quick. All, these, all this time that they met with their Savior face to face and did all these wonderful things in the name of Jesus and they were taught by Him. They saw Him. They saw the mighty miracles. They saw they, 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 all of that. Taking communion. And He goes back to fishing. I'm messing with you again, Alex. I'm sorry. He went back to fixing. Up to fishing. Fixing. I'm, I'm, I'm really country now. And as they're back in their thing, they're over there on the shore and, you know, Jesus reappears. You know the story. So let's read it and see what he does. And let's see how that applies to being all in in service today. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? <laughs> Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus answered, feed my sheep. What an awesome moment of restoring someone who had messed up. There's so much you can, you can bring into this. Uh, I've, 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 I've shared this, and that's the beauty of God's word. There's so many applications to all verses. And in this particular verse, he's restoring Peter. He could have gone over there and scolded him. Told you so. Told you so, made him feel even lower than he really was. But instead, he just he, re he restored him. And it was interesting how he restored him. He restored him by going back to the love part. Do you love me? But what I love about this scripture passage, and we'll, we'll close on this later, but uh, in, 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 the, in the Greek, there's different terminologies to, to, to different words. And, and even the word love, there's several different meanings. And, and Jesus used different meanings of love in this particular verse. The first and second time he was a, a, he just, hey, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. This is kind of acquaintance, friendship, love, you know. And then he got intimate with him. I would think that Jesus got in his face a little bit closer. Peter, do you love me? Y'all know how important it is to eye contact. You know how important it is. You can tell when somebody's really serious when they, when they really get that eye and they start looking at him. And he said, do you love me? And it, more of an intimate definition of the word love. And that's when Peter just said, <laughs> you know my heart. Jesus knew his heart before he started all that. He just needed Peter to be reminded. Yes, he loved him. So get back to doing what I ask you to do. Get back to feeding. Get back to serving. So why should we serve? Why, you know, why should we do all this stuff? You know, uh, let me give you an example of why we should. I, I've shared this before. Uh, more of a, I know I'm driving Cameron insane because I keep walking back and forth. I wish I had an answer to that, but I, my body just takes over. I can't help it. Uh, but what happens here is that I call this thing a seven-minute principle in every church. What? A seven-minute seven principle in every church. Doesn't matter what the size of the church. And what, what do I mean by that? 
in our consumer world. That's an ugly word, but it, it, it happens not only in the world, but it also happens in our church. In our consumer world, in the first seven minutes, from a person pulling into the parking lot, they've already decided whether they're going to be a part of that church or not. What? Now, think about that. Because it kind of messes up some egos, you know. Charles, Ron, Bob, me. It's not about, our, it's not about us. Because seven minutes, we hadn't even started. Guess what? It's not about the music. Because in the first seven minutes, worship hasn't even started. So why does somebody make up their mind in the first seven minutes? Same reason we talked about restaurants. They pull up. The first thing they see is, is there a place to park? If there's not a place to park, if it's not convenient for them, sometimes we lose people. They don't even come in. Some people decide in the parking lot whether they're going to follow through with church or not. I'm very excited about sharing a, a young man in, in my former church. He'll, he'll be glad that I said young. He's not really young, but, but uh, he was part of the parking team. I would get there an hour, hour and a half early every Sunday morning. And he was in the parking lot, walking the parking lot. You could see him, he'd be lifting his arms up and he would just be coming back. He was praying. Now, I know this man, so I know it wasn't a show. He meant it. He was praying for every parking place that somebody would be compelled to park in that place and not only be compelled to park there, but they would see Jesus the minute they got out of the car. And I will tell you something. He met every single person that, that, that pulled out. You might have even startled some. I don't know. But he would come to people and just say, good morning, praise Jesus. I mean, he's just one of those guys, you know, so full of the Spirit, so full of serving others. And I want to tell you, in testimonies, in our new member classes at that church, probably 25 to 30% of people that joined that church shared their first impression in the parking lot. And that's why they joined that church. Why? Because they actually saw Jesus in the parking lot. When we're following the priority commandments, loving Him first, and then taking that love that only He can give us, and serving others, guess what? People don't see us. They see Jesus. They didn't see that particular man in the parking lot. They saw Jesus. And that man was probably more responsible for, 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 jo for people joining that church than anything that the rest of us were doing. Now, is that something I'm ashamed of? No, I'm glad he was doing what God asked him to do. He was taking his gift, giving it back for Jesus. That's serving. That's feeding my sheep, feeding my lamb. The front door. Person walks in the front door. They've had a good or indifferent experience in the, in the parking lot. The front door, the, the door opens and someone greets them with a wonderful, beautiful, sincere smile says, we're glad you're here. If you're doing it for Christ, it's not fake. It's not, that's my job. I got to fake that smile. Y'all know that little thing where I got to be happy today, <laughs> whether I like it or not. No, this is a happiness that's inside of you. It comes from him. It comes from following the first commandment and the second commandment. And everything else falls into place. They see a smile. They don't see you smiling. They see Jesus. And I could keep going, not just there, but when they come in, somebody greets them and, and sits down with them and talks to them and visits with them. Somebody talks to them afterwards. Somebody sends cards later, thanking them for coming. All of that is important because all of that is the light of Jesus working together. That's a beautiful church. That's God's church. And I want to take something right now and, and just tell you I don't believe in it. And people all over the country will say, 20% do 80% of the work in churches. Well, that's probably true in, in most churches, but I don't want to stand for that. I don't, it's not scriptural. When you come to know Christ as your Savior and you become a part of the body, you're automatically a servant. It should be 100%. 
A hundred percent. Some get, we all have different gifts and we have ways to do that, but they're all important. They're equally important. So let's get into this. Why should we? In Ephesians 2.10, it says that we're created in Christ for good works. We're created. So one reason is we're very, our very creation is to serve. In 2 Timothy 1.9, we're saved and called by a, holy, by a holy calling. And I love this part because I want to tell you all, when you come into the parking lot and you see trash in the parking lot, let's say you saw a cup in the parking lot this morning. Here's what some people do. Ron, I saw a cup in the parking lot. <laughs> now we're laughing, but it's hap- it ha- and he probably could admit that right now. Charles, one of the commodes overflowed. <laughs> Let's go straight to those elders. You know what I say? The first person that sees a cup in the parking lot in God's church should pick it up. The very first ch- person. Somebody needs visiting, of course your elders and, 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 and myself, we're, we're all going to be jumping in there and visiting. But you don't have to tell me, somebody visit the church, you are going to go see them, aren't you? you know, and I want to I say right after you do. <laughs> because it's our job to serve. My job is to equip you to minister. As I'm ministering. That means you're a minister too, right? That's our job. So we're called and we're saved for that very purpose. We're also gifted for that purpose. You know that old story, the, the church of the many parts. That's a, that's a scripture we always go to on something like this. The ear and the this and the that. Have you ever had something happen to you? I've been dealing with a thumb injury ever since I moved here, and it's not going away. <laughs> but, but I want to tell you, I had no idea just how important that thumb is. I really thought, you know, I'm left-handed, and it's my right thumb. I shouldn't have to deal with anything. Wrong. I have no idea what my minor hand does. I mean, it, it, it opens doors. It does this. It opens. I was so embarrassed at our... At our baptism potluck the other day one of y'all asked me to open a jar I don't I want you to know this that humiliated me I couldn't open it because <laughs> it's my right hand that does the opening my thumb wouldn't let me that's my excuse anyway especially when somebody else went you know like, <laughs> can you imagine though I mean it, we, we all have parts and there's a reason God Put that verse in there, those verses in there. There's a reason it says that each part plays an important part for the whole of the body. And it's a perfect example. You ever heard the term turf toe? Here's these chiseled athletes in the best shape that anybody in the world. I mean, they are, and they have a turf toe. And you're thinking, it's just your toe. They miss half the season because of a turf toe. Many of them the whole season. One toe stops a perfect athlete almost from being, from being what he can be. But what do we do? And here's another obstacle even about the parts of the body. You ever wondered, we, we get jealous of our parts. The ear now starts wanting to be the toe. The hand wants to be the leg. And then there's jealousy. I shared with you, Great stories from, from that church before me. Let me share with you some other stories just to let you know that, that we, all churches have issues, right? I had, uh, in the church, we had three entrances. One was the main entrance. I feel like a flight attendant. One was the main entrance. And it was the entrance that probably two to 300 people came in. And then the other entrances, we might have collectively 50, 60 people that came in those entrances. So when we had greeters... Everybody wanted to be the greeter in the main entrance. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't have a pure reason to greet, but, but another reason they had is because they got to see everybody. And I didn't know that that would be an issue until I had to ask some of those greeters to now go to the secondary doors. No, I don't want to do that. 
I'm thinking, do those 30 people don't, don't matter to you? I mean, I, I mean that's, are, are we not serving for him? I mean, you know, but, but seriously, we, we, I had issues with jealousy amongst the, the parts. Now think about how silly that sounds. I mean, what if uh, the foot and the nose became jealous of each other? What would we have? We'd have a runny nose and smelly feet. Some of y'all get that after lunch today. But what I'm getting at is it's silly when we start being jealous of each other. It defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do. Every part of the body is important. Remember what I said? That turf toe reminded that athlete how important that part of the body was. I'm reminded daily of that thumb, how important that part of the body is. In the church, God put that passage together to let you know everything that we do here is important. Picking up the cup in the parking lot is just as important as what I'm doing right now. Because it could cause someone to stumble, not literally, but spiritually in the parking lot. Somebody in a consumer mindset would say they don't, tear, they don't take care of their parking lot. They're not going to take care of their church. I don't want to be in there. Now, you and I think that's not a really mature reason for coming to church. But you know what? It ain't about us. And if we're trying to reach the lost world, then maybe we have to counter some consumerism ideas by being excellent in what we do. But we do it not for us. We do it for Him. So we have the, the calling that we're all called. Also, the spiritual gifts. We're going to start taking spiritual gift inventories here more often. We're doing them in our membership class, but we're going to start taking it where everybody in the church eventually gets to take one of those. Uh, most people that take spiritual gift inventories already know kind of where their gifts are. But just like communion and everything else, we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded. I, I have gone before, and, and I could do that in here, but you know, just from knowing people from just a short amount of time, I could pick one of y'all and say, you know what? You would be perfect for being a greeter. You're thinking. And, and that person might be, oh. I said, I've seen you every week for the past 12 weeks. You have a contagious smile. You, you have a, a down-to-earth personality. People are drawn to you. You would be perfect. Now, they might not even think they, they feel that way, but, but that's what I see. That's what, you know, and, and I'm not, but, but yet it's not, as a servant, we should all be available and ready to do all, you know, to serve God. And, and, but don't underestimate yourself. Some of the greatest evangelists are shy introverts. Some of the greatest, uh, uh, you know, other servants, uh, they're, they're areas that may, they may not even know that they would be gifted in. But he's given us a gift, and that's something that we ought to study, and we ought to share and, and use. But also the church needs us. I talked to you about the seven-minute principle. Well, we need to counter the seven-minute principle by having people in the parking lot like the guy I described. But this is a little church. It doesn't matter. In fact, I told the, the, the parking team in the church I came from, they had a, had a whole bunch of people doing it, and there was more people that wanted to do it, but they wouldn't let them in. Tur you know, turfism. You know, we were, we've got it. We've got it. And I said, you know what? You may only need six out there, but there's nothing wrong with having eight out there. If God gave eight people the, 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 the idea to get out there, then I said, that's just more to do for people. A woman comes in, uh, a single mom and her children and all that, she's carrying all this stuff. Get in there and help her. I mean, we got eight people now. We get in there and help her and walk her to church. Watch, watch people be melted by Jesus Christ, the light of, Christ, of Jesus. We are all gifted. We all have a place. And there's never too many. Let me go ahead and tell you that. Don't ever say, well, there's, a, there's, just, there's plenty over there helping already. I'll tell you right now from the eight or ten that are doing a lot of work right now at, at Waterstone, uh, they could use help. They could use your help. And if 500 want to help us, there's a place for you. If we have to rotate people, praise God, we've got that kind of thing. That, but, but we need, you need to serve. And we need to give you an opportunity to serve. And we need you. We need you to share the love of Jesus with everybody that's around because you're going to be the light that I couldn't be that particular day. That's why I need you. You might be an ear and I'm a nose. I need you. We need each other. 
So understand that the gifted for service as well. Keep in mind also, some people may have, quote, priority gifts, but let me, let me go ahead and share with you the servanthood is to serve. Um, I was in an event one time where one of the ladies that was leading our prayer team, and I want to tell you, that was a, a, a true gift of hers. She was our, quote, prayer warrior. Man, one time I, I had a kidney stone, and I, any of you that had those, you understand. I mean, it hurts, you know, and, and I, here I was. I, I, I did not take the medicine for the kidney stone because I, I needed to teach that night, and I didn't want to be loopy, you know, and all this stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm teaching like this. Everybody thinks I'm intense, you know, but I am. I'm intense. It hurts. And, and I mean, my prayer warrior, she came over there in, in our intermission time, and she just, she just, and I'm going to tell you, within, within 15 minutes, I'm like, whoa, where'd it go? That is awesome. You know, she's my prayer warrior, but let me tell you what she did one day. We had a, you ever heard of flexibility in church? Anybody? You know, you know, sometimes you have to be flexible. We had this big, big evangelist, evangelical event one time, and things were going so well. We had over more people than we ever expected. God was really blessing this. And we had to, at the spur of the moment, we had to have an overflow room, which involved immediate moving of chairs. And I, had, and, and I was desperate. I, you know, all I could do, and this is the beautiful thing, if we're all following those verses... Charles and, you know, I mean, you know, Ron can, can just go up. He, he won't have to, and we have to do this sometimes, by the way. I need somebody to help me. They won't do it. They, they'll look, they won't do it. Oh, would you, you know, we need to be able to go. Can you help me? And this lady, I'll never forget, as long as I live, she goes, that's not my gift. Wow. That's not my gift. Now, if she had a back problem, I understand. You know, there's a physical reason why she can't lift a chair. But guys, we're here to serve. Yes, there's a priority gift, and, and some of you are gifted in teaching. The, teach. We need you. You're gifted in this. You're gifted in that. But God tells us to put action to our words, to put action. And that means sometimes if, if, we have, if the room needs to be gutted, let's all get up and move a chair, you know, not, it's, my, it's not my gift. I didn't know what to say. I couldn't say anything. I just went on and we worked around her. Uh, you know, and I'm not picking on it being a female. A male could have said the same thing. It's just the, the, the fact that they said that. I was like, wow. You know, <laughs> so understand the heart of serving. It's not about us. Hey, I need you to pick this up. I'm sure there's somebody else that could do that. It's not about us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but He came to serve. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man didn't come to be served. Man, if He, if he doesn't need to be served, and if he, He's here to serve, man, what should we, we, we be doing? He's setting the example for us. I mean, you know all through the, the, the Scriptures, He does that for the disciples. He washes their feet. He does all kinds of examples throughout the, about the scripture. Letting, in, a, in a wedding, he set the furthest place where the, the insignificant people sat. That's where he sat. I mean, that's, Jesus was all about serving others. And he's asking us to do the same. We owe this to our Christ because he did it all for us. Think about it. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave everything. His son. Everything. And what is he asking of us? To be all in. To serve him with all our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and to serve others as well. So we're to be all in for Christ. Let's, let's continue with this, this verse, though. Peter needed that reassurance. Peter needed to know that when he denied Christ he needed to know that Jesus still loved him. As a servant, we're going to have our consumer moments, aren't we? I thought it was interesting that I was speaking this message today and last night I was in a long line in a drive through and it was so easy for me to go, this is ridiculous, I'm not going back to this place. You know, 
and, 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 you know, stop and think what they're going through. Probably there were three people in that whole restaurant cooking and serving and doing everything, you know, and, but yet I'm so, I'm in my car in my air conditioner and, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, how dare them make me sit in my car for an extra couple of minutes. And boy, did I get a slap in the face. I, I love it. When, I don't love it, but I, but I need it, okay? When Jesus just gives me that humility slap. Marty, do you love me? Yeah. Yeah, Lord, I do love you, but let me get my burger first. <laughs> I think that was the first one. Marty, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I do. I do. I do. I, you know, yeah, they're probably having troubles in there, but uh, I'm hungry. Marty? What? Then the rooster comes across my, my yard, I mean, you know, in front of my car. And, and, and then I think, wow, I just betrayed. I, <laughs> yes, Lord, you know what's in my heart. Then feed my sheep. So I guess in closing, I want to ask you something. Waterstone Fellowship, do you love me? That's Jesus talking. And I'm Waterstone Fellowship just like you. Yes, Lord, we love you. But that all in thing? Waterstone Fellowship, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I, I'll make an effort to come a little more and maybe even serve a few times. Watch me, I'm going to sign up. Waterstone Fellowship. Do you love me? Just think about that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you so much for restoring us when we fail you. Thank you so much for giving us a true, pure definition of your priority commandment. And how when we do that, everything else falls into place. Father, I pray that we take the words of the worship that it's not about me, but it's about you. Less of me, more of you. And we take it to heart. Father, help us be all in for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Next week, all in again. Uh, dealing, with, uh, re dealing with giving and tithing and things. Guys, remember, if we follow this procedure... Our pocketbooks are his. They're not ours. Being all in is not, Lord, you can have everything but. It's, Lord, it's all yours. And it's a privilege. And it's a celebration. I hope you'll be back next week. Thank you.